All right. Thank you, Richard. That was great. Good lesson, especially as we, uh, no one wants to, to hear, but uh, school's coming. And so, uh, especially as we think about the school year coming, uh, that's a good reminder that uh, even though the world tells you that uh, you can put up barriers, and even though the world tells you that you can divide yourself as, as much as you want, uh, the truth is that God wants us to love each other, and God wants us to work together and be a blessing for each other, and so um, it's a good message for the kids this morning. <clears throat> We're going to hear God's word this morning from John chapter 9. John chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. And before we even hear God's word this morning, I want to ask a question. My question is this, how do you respond when you see suffering? How do you respond when you see suffering? Jim, if you could take care of the slides this time, that'd be great. How do you respond when you see suffering? When you see on the news that there's persecution in Nigeria, that churches are being burned down, that there's horrible things happening to Christians there. You see on the news of, of tragedies that, that take place, how do you respond? What's the first thought that you have for people in those situations? When, when you're walking downtown Chicago, as I'm sure many of you have, and you see someone who is, is sitting against a building, and his clothes are raggedy, and he has a dirty styrofoam coffee cup in his hand, Please, please, do you have any change? Please, can you help me out just a little bit? Please, can you help me? What's the first thought that you have about that person? Do you wonder how they got there? Do you wonder what twists and turns their life took in order for them to get to be where they are today? When loved ones around you, I mentioned at the beginning of the service, when a loved one loses her job, how do you respond? first thought, I wonder if it was something she did. I wonder if there was some conduct that, that she shouldn't have done. I wonder if she made some sort of choice. I, I wonder what happened when we, we hear that they were let go. Our passage this morning, John 9, gets right at the heart of those questions. I'm going to bring a really simple sermon to you this morning, and it only has two points, and, and in fact, I'll tell them to you right now, text and today. We're going to think about the text, and we're going to think about Today. And so that's the first thing we're going to look at the text. Look with me at verses 1 and 2 of John 9. As he went along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And maybe they asked this question because what we just heard at the end of chapter 8 was, was a radical call from Jesus toward discipleship. Jesus has just been extremely clear that you can tell whose child you are, whether you're a child of God or whether you're a child of the devil. You can tell whose child you are, whether you're a child of Abraham or a child of the devil. God, Jesus said, you can tell who you are by what you do. And so Jesus has just emphasized how important our conduct is, how important our behavior is, how important our choices are. And immediately on the heels of this teaching, they come across a man who is there blind. And I picture him like you've seen some people in Chicago on Lower Wacker Drive. A man who is begging, saying, I've never been able to see. I can't work. I can't provide for myself. I need help. The disciples say, how did this happen? How could this be? What you need to know here is that the disciples' view was common. 
the disciples' view was common. And in some ways, they're working out their theology of the Garden of Eden. In some ways, they're, they're thinking back to the beginning and thinking how, how Adam and Eve sinned and immediately there were consequences for their sin. Immediately, they are evicted from the Garden and immediately they're told of their imminent death, that they are going to die just as God had told them. And so the disciples make an extremely tight connection between conduct and consequences. There's teachings from, from rabbis in their day who used to say that, that, that children in the womb were guilty of sin if, if their mom, while she was pre- pregnant, went to the pagan temples and worshipped foreign gods, that, that the children in utero were somehow committing sin. And so they wonder, has this baby Was this a child that that sinned and caused himself to be this way? Or did the parents do something? Jesus, whose fault is this? Did the parents do something? Did this man do something? Tell us why this happened. And Jesus gives a surprising answer. Look with me at verse 3. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. What Jesus is not saying here is that this man and his parents are completely holy, that are, they are completely sinless. What Jesus is doing is answering the question the disciples asked. Which of their sins caused it? And Jesus says, neither of their sins caused this to happen. Well, then why did it happen? So that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Somehow, God is going to take this incredibly evil and hurtful and painful situation and show that he's working through it. Then Jesus says some cryptic language. He says, it's day and we have to do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Most people believe that Jesus' words, night is coming when no one can work, is is the time of, of darkness on the earth when when Jesus was crucified, the time between his death and resurrection, and, and his disciples were paralyzed with fear and no work was being done. So Jesus basically says, as long as I'm around, I have to be the light of the world. I have to do the work that God has called me to do. And practically this means that Jesus brings light into the man's world. You know how the light work or how the, how your eyes work, don't you? You know that your eyes, the the black part of your eyes is called a pupil. And as light decreases, your pupils increase so that more light can be brought in. And light shines through a lens in your eye and, and hits the back of your eyeball, your retina. And it goes to your optic nerve, which sends a message to your brain, which decodes it and understands it and helps you to be able to see. Light has to be present in order for your eyes to work. Either the sun is shining light directly in or light is bouncing off the pew in front of you into your eyeball so that your eyes can see the light of the things around you. And Jesus, on a big picture level, says, I am the light of the world. But on a much smaller, much personal scale, says, I am going to shine light into this man's darkness. So Jesus spits on the ground He makes mud with the saliva and he puts it on the man's eyes. And then, verse 7. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. Have you heard of the pool of Siloam? This water was known for saving life. This water was known for saving life. In 701 B.C., Jerusalem was under siege. And King Hezekiah knew that the Assyrian army was coming quickly. And the Assyrian army had, had surrounded the city of Jerusalem. And so King Hezekiah, even though he knew he was surrounded, he didn't worry. 
Because the army was surrounding the town thinking, as long as we cut them off from food and from water, they can only last so long. We've cut off all supplies from the outside, therefore we've got them. But Hezekiah didn't panic because Hezekiah and the wisdom that he had from God, Hezekiah had built a tunnel that fed underground into the pool of Siloam, this very same pool. It was a man-made pool that was there as, as basically a reservoir in case of, of, of military holding the city hostage. And so because... Hezekiah had that foresight to build the tunnel, to have it bring water from another source, to have water available for the city. Because Hezekiah did that by God's grace, the city was not taken, but instead was safe. And so the people, when they see this pool, they always are reminded of the way that God provided, that God gave them life, that though there were enemies at the door, God had protected them and God had saved them and God had given them their lives. And Jesus says, go to that water and wash your eyes off. Go to that place which means sent because that water was sent from far away into that man-made pool and it protected the life of the city. Go to that place where you might recognize that pool of Siloam because just a few chapters back in chapter 6, it was the same pool where the priests would go to receive water for the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember the water ceremony when Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and he'll never be thirsty again. And Jesus fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies, all the prophecies about Messiah, and he ushers in this messianic age of, of this time when the Spirit would come in and flood the temple. Water was drawn from that very same pool of Siloam. And Jesus says, go to the pool and wash. And Miracle of miracles, the man who was born blind came home seeing. The second half of verse 7. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit here and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man where you get that phrase. Verse 10, how then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. We find that the neighbors can barely believe it. Is that him? Some of them said, isn't that the same guy? All these years? He's been begging? No, 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 no. That can't be him. Maybe, maybe he has a brother. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe someone just looks a lot like him. Because, yeah, there's a lot of similarities. It can't be him. This guy's been blind since birth. He says, no, it's me. And he tells what Jesus did. There's three things that I'd like to bring out of the text this morning and into our second major point today. Into today. And the first lesson we should learn is be careful when naming direct causes. Be careful when naming direct causes. There are certain times in the Bible when it is abundantly clear when the sin of a person causes a certain kind of consequence. There's certain Biblical accounts where we see a one-to-one -one relationship. And God makes it extremely clear how, how certain people, when they're unfaithful to him, there is immediate consequence. And probably the most notable place is in the New Testament regarding the Lord's Supper. If we could see that slide from 1 Corinthians 11. The people there are, are eating and drinking in an unworthy manner. And, and Paul writes, For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Paul says, you've been getting sick, and even some of you have died, because you haven't done communion the way that Christ intended you to do it. And so there are sometimes in, the, in Scripture, uh, 
sin and consequence tied closely together. But then there's huge exceptions in the Bible too, where this is not a standard rule. It's not that we always have to figure out, well, well, who did what to cause this? Instead, you look at places like the book of Job. And Job is a righteous man. And his friends come and say, well, Job, you must have done something wrong. You, you must have hidden, had hidden sin in your heart because, because God doesn't just take things away from people. God doesn't just, you know, cause these kinds of things to happen. Job, what have you done wrong? God must be punishing you. And on and on and on they go. And eventually God says to his friends, you're not being friends at all. You're not comforting him. You're not consoling him. This is not right at all. Or you think about Paul, the Apostle Paul, and he says that, that he had a thorn in his flesh. And he doesn't say it was there because of some sin he committed, but instead it was there because it was a messenger from Satan. It was meant to discourage him. And you look at today's text, and Jesus completely says, this man is not blind because of some sin that he or his parents committed, but instead it's so God can work through it. And this is, unfortunately, something that needs to be said today. Some of you know the televangelist Pat Robertson. And Pat Robertson has, I think he's brought a lot of people to Christ. I think he's done a lot of good for God's kingdom. But also he's, he's brought some black eyes to the church as well. There was recently a news story uh, saying that, that, that Disney World was going to have gay days at their park. And they're going to fly rainbow flags. And, and it's really disheartening and heartbreaking for those of us who, who follow Scripture, who know that that's not how God intends things to be, not to embrace and celebrate that kind of lifestyle. And so in response, these words from Pat Robertson. I would warn Orlando that you're right in the way of some serious hurricanes. And I don't think I'd be waving those flags in God's face if I were you. It'll bring about terrorist bombs. It'll bring earthquakes, tornadoes, and possibly a meteor. Those are the kinds of things that cause people who are on the fence and wondering about who God is and what Scripture teaches. When someone who is a nationally known Christian leader comes out and makes these one-to-one -one direct causes kinds of claims. He also made claims about after 9-11 took place, how this is God's punishment from heaven bringing down buildings. That's a stumbling block for people who are seeking out the gospel. And in some ways, that causes people not just to stumble in their faith, but to walk away from their faith and say, if that's what Christianity is, is trying to, to blame people and causing, uh, giving, giving causes for, for all the things that go wrong in the world. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't think any of us would say something so foolish, yet we're called to tame our tongues and to be careful with what we say so that we're not as unhelpful as Job's comforters. Well, what else do we learn from this passage? God uses hardship for his glory. God uses hardships for his glory. We know from Scripture that hardships grow character. James 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. If you could have that slide up next. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may, not, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. When we go through trials, when we go through hardships, when we go through like what this man went through, being born blind and wondering what good is going to come of this, how can this be to know God is somehow working through this. And one of the ways that God works through this is causes us to be complete, causes us to be mature, causes us to have perseverance. I was reading recently about prayer, and it really applies as well to the different circumstances that we face in life, that, that so often we want to pray that, that God would get me out 
of the situation I'm in. But, but probably an even more appropriate prayer for us as Christians is not so much, get me out, but instead, God, get me through. Right? Give me the grace to be able to grow through this. Give me the grace to learn perseverance. Give me the grace to become complete and mature, as Scripture says I will be. Lisa and I have friends who had a, a sick child recently who was hospitalized. And even in the midst of that hospitalization, even in the midst of, of wondering about medical concerns and how it is all going to turn out, the wife of this couple said, you know, the first thing that we wonder is less about her own health and more we wonder, how is God going to use this so that we can minister to other people in our lives? How is God going to use this to develop me, to mature me, to help me, so that I can help parents in similar situations, so I can help people who are going through similar circumstances. How is God going to use this to use me to help others? It's a good lesson to learn. And a third one, God still does miracles. God still does miracles. Dare to pray. Dare to pray. Humanly speaking, this man who was born blind, this man who has no memory in his mind of how to see things, of how to process things, for his retina to talk to his optic nerve and his optic nerve to talk to his brain to decode and understand everything. Humanly speaking, this man had no chance. But with God, all things are possible. There's a story in rural Mississippi about 50 years ago of, of a group of, of farmers who were really concerned about their crops. And, and their crops were extremely dry. You may remember a few years ago we had similar seasons around here where, where the corn just looks anemic almost, right? And it looks like you could just knock it over with your hand because it looks so weak. And, and it was such a, a dry summer for these farmers that they, they decided that uh, they called a prayer meeting at the church. And they said, you know what, let's, let's all get together and let's pray. And let's just ask that, that God would end this drought and provide the rain for our crop. And, and, and about a dozen or so farmers showed up and, and most of them showed up. It was a work night, so most of them showed up in their work boots and in their uh, bib overalls, and, and they, they looked like they came straight out of the fields, right into the pews, ready to pray and ready to ask God to bring the rain. But there was one person who didn't have his work boots on. There was one farmer who wore waders to church. Right? The type of, of knee-high water boots that you might go fly fishing in, right? Because the rain's coming. And so he came with faith, wearing knee-high rubber boots, saying, if we're going to ask God to do this, we're going to have faith that God is going to do this. Right? You, you don't just come weakly to God and say, well, God, maybe if it's okay with you, I thought you might you know, maybe think it's okay to maybe send a few drops of rain. But instead to say, God, we need rain and we trust that you're going to provide and we're going to show that we trust that you are going to provide. I shared a bit of a vision with the elders on Monday night. I told them that, that God has really placed it heavy on my heart that we need to pray that, that God would bring people in, especially this fall season. Pray that God would bring people in to a new season, a, a new sermon series, a new season of, of Sunday school and church activities, a new time when people often sending their kids back to school and, and seeing these changes in the season start to say, you know, I wonder, you know, we're taking care of our kids educationally. I wonder if we should do something for them spiritually. And so I, I told the elders, I really want us to pray and ask that God would bring people in and, and see that momentum come into the fall family nights and, and see God bring people in and God to bring about a harvest. And so the elders have been praying. I've been praying over a month and I'm going to keep praying for the next month or so asking, God, please bring these people in. Pre please bring these people in. And I want you to pray the same. And I was thinking about the story of these farmers who brought their waiters to church. And in some ways, I, I just thought, how cool would it be if in September, instead of bringing our waiters to church, we brought our folding chairs to church? 
and said, you know what? I'm praying not just in a wishy-washy kind of way, oh God, it'd be really, really nice to, to have a few extra people here, but instead to say, God, fill this place. God, let it be that there's not even any seats so that we have to bring in more. God, if we have to, we'll put that annex seating back up. God, we want you to fill this place, not for our glory, but instead so that your works can be done, so that we can see you bringing about the harvest, God, because ultimately this is about what you are doing. We see this man who was born blind. We see him see at the end of the story. We see him testifying. As we dream about what God could do, as we dream about how God could answer prayers and do more than we could ask or imagine, as we dream about even what he's doing in our hardships, we think about how he's somehow working through it, how somehow he's bringing glory out of it. I want to ask yourself this question in conclusion. Do you have eyes to see God's work in your life today? This man who was born blind was given sight. I really hope that God gives you the vision to be able to see what God's doing in your life around you, that you can see the good he's doing here, that you can see the good he's doing in your family's life, in your work life, and all the different places that God's bring, God brings you. I want you to see that with eyes wide open, what God is doing today. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful for your word this morning. Thank you for this miracle that you did for this man who was born blind. Thank you, Lord, for the assurance that we don't need to examine ourselves with a fine-tooth comb, anything difficult happens, but instead we need to live with eyes wide open, ready to look and see how you're going to bring good out of it, ready to look and see how your work is going to be displayed in our lives, ready to look and see how you're going to bring glory out of it. Lord, if it means growing us individually, we pray that you would do that and work mightily in each of us. And we pray too, Lord, that we'd have faith to pray big prayers and to come with, with big dreams and know, Lord, that when we ask in faith that you do answer us. Lord, help us not to be wishy and washy in our, in our prayer life, but instead to come with total trust and total dependence and total faith that you are going to answer our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we can